Okay, it's the week before Christmas, and the conflict between Jesus and these believers who he has been talking with in um, this later half of chapter 8 is coming to a head. And today's reading is where it's actually going to take uh, its most intense turn yet. They are angry with what Jesus has been saying, and so they say this to him. Aren't we right in saying that you are a Samaritan and demon-possessed? Those are the two charges they levy against Jesus. A, that he's a Samaritan, which we know he isn't, and two, that he's demon-possessed. Why are they saying these things? It's possible that by calling him Samaritan, what they're really saying is, you don't have any regard for the law of Moses, the first five books of the Hebrew scriptures. They're saying, you you don't care about the law. You're just as good as a Samaritan, which we know they don't really like very much. And then the second charge is that he's demon-possessed. Now, this is serious. This is the same thing, if you go back and look in the Synoptic Gospels, that um, Jesus is calling the unforgivable sin. To say that the Son of God is demon-possessed, which means the adversary to God, is the thing that he's going to respond to. And uh, you can kind of read it in the language that Jesus speaks here. He's, he's pretty ticked about this one. He says, I'm not possessed by a demon, but I honor my father and you dishonor me. I am not seeking glory for myself, but there is one who seeks it and he is the judge. And I think that verse 50 is the key here. I am not seeking glory for myself. To be demon possessed, to be a follower of the adversary of God is like saying, you're, you're going after your own will. Remember, this is the thing in the garden that the serpent whispers to Adam and Eve. It's this charge of take the knowledge of good and not good for yourself. Define it for you. Do whatever is right in your own eyes. And that is the very thing that throughout his entire ministry, Jesus came to reject and to do the opposite of. Jesus even says it right here. I come to do what is right in my father's eyes, not what's right in my own eyes. And it's that charge that Jesus will continually um, say when he's in the garden even, not my will, but your will be done, Father. This is what gives him the um, authority and the ability to be the, the one who comes to die for us. And he says, very truly I tell you, whoever obeys my word, his teachings, whoever follows the way of Jesus will never see death. Now, this is not saying if you follow Jesus, you're never going to physically die. The death that Jesus is referring to here is not a physical death. It's an eternal death. The one who follows the teachings of Jesus is not going to um, experience that death as punishment that is a result of sin. They're going to experience the true life. In fact, in the Greek, this verse 51 reads more like this. He will never taste of death forever. It's very emphatic. We'll never taste of death forever. Why? Because you're going to be uh, counted among the ones who live eternally. And then skip down to the very last section. Um, Verse 58, Jesus says, very truly I tell you, before Abraham was born, I am. And this is the statement that really just ups the ante. By now, you've probably um, heard at least once in John's gospel what Jesus is getting at. He says, I am. This is linking back to the name that God gave Moses at the burning bush in Exodus 3. What Jesus is saying is that he is equal with God. He is divine. Yes, Jesus came and was human and put on flesh and lived among us, but Jesus was also divine. And he doesn't sugarcoat it at all. He knows um, exactly that they're going to understand what he's saying here. That word, I am. And there's a couple of other times he alludes to it here in this section of the end of chapter 8. And it's to this charge that they just react so strongly Uh, They pick up stones, and they're intending to stone him to death. And we're told before that can happen, Jesus slips away from the temple grounds. Uh, The ESV talks about it's not his hour. The hour has not yet come for him to die. So this section I have found just really interesting. It's a reminder to me about what do I say, who do I say that Jesus is. A lot of people levy a lot of different claims about who Jesus is. Maybe not as strong as he's demon-possessed, right? But it really does matter. And I think this shows that Jesus really does care what we believe about him. So maybe it would be helpful for you just a little bit before the Christmas holiday. What perfect timing 
to spend some time just reminding yourself, who do you say that Jesus is? What are the words that you would use to describe them? And what do you think Jesus would have to say about those words? Merry Christmas, y'all.